So guys, I get the in, incredible privilege um, to try to tackle the task of teaching on the core practices of the church, the functions, and do so in 45 minutes. Uh, so uh, it may be a little fast and furious. So uh, if you have the dictation on your email, on your, for your notes to have just record, maybe better for you, <laughs> okay? Um, but we're going to try to get through this, okay? So um, if you will, open up your Bibles to Matthew 28. Um, we're going to be in verse 18 through 20. Probably seems familiar to a lot of you. This is Christ's great commission to his disciples and who would eventually become the um, the apostles, right? And so, uh, as you turn there, maybe the question is in your, in your mind, why is it a core practice of the church to teach biblical doctrine? What is biblical doctrine? Or more generally than that, what is doctrine, right? You know, to, to, to a world around us, doctrine's like, oh, that's one of those big theological terms. We don't need to worry about those things. But it's not really that big of a deal. Um, don't be afraid of big words. Actually, I, pres- I prefer uh, when you do hear them uh, that you uh, be curious. Go look. Go study. What, the, what does that mean? That will give you a better understanding um, of what that is. So basically, doctrine is um, just a teaching is what that word basically means. Doctrine is just teaching. Okay? And so with doctrine meaning teaching and biblical being in front of that, we're talking about biblical teaching. That's all that is. Biblical doctrine is just biblical teaching. Stuff that comes from the word of God. Right? Um, this doctrine, this teaching, is the basis in which everything we do as the church um, comes from. Everything comes from this book. Everything. Okay? This afternoon we'll be looking over a few texts and a few, I mean 11. So we're going to be busy, okay, um, that uh, give us a better grasp of the importance of this doctrine. This is this teaching, this, this word of God. Yet this is not a comprehensive list because there's no possible way I could do so in one sitting unless I was uh, here for a couple weeks. Um, it will give us the sense of why it's important, and we will dig into Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And it reads, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Here we have this great commission, right? We have this calling, this command from Christ to his disciples to go out and make disciples, right? Right? So Christ challenges in Matthew 28, 18 through, 18 through 20 is a part of the great. Within this text, we see Christ called to go, right? That's the, that's the command, go now. It's not like, hey, wait. When you're making disciples, no, hey, let's not do that. Let's wait. Let's, let's, let's wait on the thing. Oh, he says, go. That's important. Go right now. There is no time like the present. Make disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them all that Christ has commanded. So this would be the beginning of the church age, guys, which we're currently in. What I want for you to learn about this text uh, is that it was Christ's challenge and commission to his disciples that gave us our first look at teaching biblical doctrine. Within this challenge, Christ commanded the disciples to teach all that he commanded, right? All that he commanded uh, them. There were going to be specific things that Christ would have taught them concerning the coming church age. But a broader view of this would also incorporate those teachings of Christ and the Old Testament. um, That would have been known by Christ's disciples. These teachings were going to be the very foundation on which the church was going to be formed and used to grow. Um, some of these examples, uh, as Christ fulfilling the demands of the law, uh, required in entering a new covenant of grace through his blood, fulfilling the prophets of old, um, as uh, had fulf- fulfilling that what the prophets of old had prophesied of the Messiah to come, the promise from God to David that one day a seed from his bloodline would be the king whose kingdom would last forever. 
that he would not look at the outside of the man, but what was in his heart, breaking the idea of the man-made Jewish customs. That salvation could only come from believing that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing man could have, that, that believing man could have eternal life just to name a few. These foundational truths needed to be taught to the surrounding world. This was the task of the apostles starting in Acts. And today, this is to be done by who? Us, right? Or leaders, pastors, right? They're the ones who lead us, right? They are the ones that, the, the heralds for the church. Um, so, we will briefly turn to Romans 10, 14, and 15, if you'll turn there, to see the importance of preaching as the main avenue for teaching biblical doctrine. Okay? Romans 10, 14, and 15 says... How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will this preach? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Right? So actually, before we get there, I want you to jump back up to Romans 13. That's going to give you context of what he's talking about, okay? Romans 13 says... For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? That is the context in which verses 14 and 15 are talking about. Um, Paul then goes into the point of the importance and role of the pastor with, with four questions, right? In the Atlanta text, let's go there. Um, verse 14, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they going to know? Unless, who, who are they going to believe in? right? That's the question. Who, how do they know who they're going to believe in, right? That's the question he's asking him in, in Christ is what he's talking about there. The second question answers that, well, how will they believe in him, who's Christ, whom they have not heard? If they're going to believe in him, they have to hear it, right? They have to hear who he is, right? And how will they hear the gospel of Christ without a preacher? Who is going to take the message to them? That's the preacher, right? That's the preacher's role, is to take the gospel to the lost world. And lastly, how will they preach unless they are sent? Sent by who? God, right? God. How does that work for us today? Anybody know? How does that work? How, how do we send out people, right? That's from the church. We are to be the one training and discipling others. We are the one that's going to be training and discipling new. We are the avenue in which the word of God, biblical doctrine, should be going out into the lives of its local congregations and preparing men and women for the ministry. Okay? That's how it's supposed to work. Okay? Um, you see, the role of the pastor is to carry the message of the gospel is pivotal to the salvation of the church. This will help us understand our next text from this lesson, okay? Pivotal role of the, of the preacher, right? It has to be sent. He has to take the message to them, okay? This, this doctrine, this unknown thing that's to the unknown world, they don't understand it. They won't know it unless we take it to them, unless we preach it, we herald what Christ and what that doctrine is. So if you will, turn me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 2 through 5. So this, this, this second letter of Timothy, Paul is dealing with difficult times here in chapter 3 before difficult times will come. And how is Timothy supposed to respond whenever those difficult times will come, right? We have in there, uh, in verse 1, verse chapter 4, it says, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God 
and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge and living of the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, right? Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Verse five, but you, Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Paul, as he's writing this letter to Timothy, is dealing with real world issues that they're facing. And it's the same issues we're facing today. It hasn't changed since this letter was written. But what's going on? What is going on in Timothy's world that Paul has to write a letter about it? Right? Because he just says difficult times will come in chapter 3. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go through verses 3 and 4 to tell you the problem. And verses 2 and 5 to figure out the remedy of it. What Paul's uh, was teaching them. So, verses three, it begins, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The issue here isn't that they are not hearing sound doctrine, right? It's saying they will not endure it. They don't want to sit under it. Why? Because what is, sound doctrine can be hard. It tells us who we are as people. It tells us who we are as sinners. It tells us of our flesh. It tells us that our heart is desperately wicked. Who could know it, right? Uh, you're a sinner. You are need grace. All these things, right? That is hard to hear for some people. And what do they do? They, wouldn't, they won't endure it anymore. They're tired of it. Chances are because they're not really believers. They're tired of listening to it. So what do they do? Keep reading, but wanting to have their ears tickled. In Timothy's day, there was always somebody trying to come up with something new, right? Always trying to come up with the newest thing to talk about. Oh, this great speaker or, or all these things. And that's what, the, that, that's what they were desiring. They wanted something new. Something that's like, oh, I haven't heard that before. And that's kind of what happened um, Christ whenever he was uh, at, in the Galilee area. As he was preaching, people were hearing something they'd never heard before. It was tickling their ears. But now we're in 2 Timothy after Christ has ascended and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And we have sound doctrine being taught. Yet they don't want it. It's not good enough anymore. They want something new. So then what does it lead to after that? Keep going on. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. This is not good. Why? Because what are the desires of man? They're fleshly, right? They are not the desires of God. They're not the truth. They are relative, right? The world that we live in now. What is truth? Well, it can be whatever it wants to be right? It hadn't changed here either. It was still going on then. It hasn't changed. They didn't want it anymore, guys. So they, what they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick the guy that speaks the way I want him to speak. I want to go to the church in which they have the things that I want. Um, they have the youth program and the children's program and the worship is awesome. And they're not talking about the preaching. They're talking about the music. That's what they consider worship. Um, even though it's a part of it. They're looking for all the wrong things. They know what truth is, or they should, because it's been in front of them. It's been taught. It's been handed down from generation to generation at this point. And they will turn away their ears from truth. Sad. That's what happens. They don't, they don't even care about truth anymore. And they turn to myths. 
that is the situation every single one of us faces today. We have an incredible opportunity to look at people like this and just like Paul is about to encourage Timothy what to do, we have the answers. They're in here. It's not hard, it just takes discipline to get in it. It's not hard to do, it takes time. You can't just know how to build a motor just by reading a short synopsis of how a motor works, right? No, you gotta dig into it, right? You gotta understand all the parts. Um, same thing with this word. You can't understand what it fully means without digging into it. You can't understand the condition of man. You can't even understand the, the grace of God, the grace that comes through Christ in it. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. My notes fell out. I'm gonna have to flip through now. Um, so what does Paul tell Timothy to do, starting in verse two, preach the word. That is his first call. Preach the word. Basically, teach biblical doctrine. It's exactly what he's talking about. Teach biblical doctrine. Teach scripture. That's important, right? Then what else do you say? Be prepared. How many of you know people that are... Um, Preppers that are prepping for the prepping for the end times. The apocalypse is coming one day, and I'm going to be ready. Right? I want you to have the mentality, but not the brain behind that. Okay? I want you to have the thinking behind that. Okay? He says, "Be prepared in season and out of season." What does that mean? Always be ready to give an account of what God has done and is going to do. Okay? Always be prepared to give an account what God is, is going, has done for you and also what he's going to do. The promises of God, right? And not only that, do it when the times seem good to do so. And out of seasons, whenever it doesn't seem good to do it at all. Be faithful. Be steady. Be prepared. He moves on to say, reprove. What does that mean? To expose sin, right? And to let scripture convict. It's one thing for us to give wisdom, but it's a whole nother thing whenever we use scripture to help, help point to truth. Because that is what's going to change the heart of man. Your wisdom, your encouragement, that is one thing, but scripture is what changes the heart. Okay? Rebuke uh, to express disapproval according to Scripture. Everything is supposed to be done through the lens of Scripture because that is how they are, it's, it's, that's going to expose it. So this is why I believe what I believe because this is what the Scripture says, right? To exhort, to urge and encourage through Scripture, right? There are Scripture throughout the Psalms of encouragement you don't have to go and figure out how to way to encourage people. Just dig in your word. You can find encouraging stuff there. You can, you can go through Psalm 23, and you can hear about how the Lord provides, right? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside the still waters. That's comforting. That's a way to be encouraging. It doesn't have to be your thoughts. It can just be scripture. Now, it'll be a good thing if you understand what you were talking about. That's the point, Right? And how, what does Paul say, how did he do this? He says to do it with great patience, right? It's going to be hard, and it's not going to happen like that. People are not going to change just like that. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to continue to preach, to be prepared, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, and do so in a way that understanding that it's going to probably take a while. It's not going to be short-term, especially in the world we live in. We think, well, I've got my cell phone, and I want to look up how Des Bryant is doing today, so I'm going to look that up, and boom, there it is. Right? No, that's not how it works, right? Whenever you're dealing with sin, it needs to be with 
great patience, right? But he also says with instruction, have a plan. Don't just go into it willy-nilly, say, oh, well, he's doing this, so that's what we're going to do. No, think about it. Think of how you are going to go about and use Scripture to deal with sin, use Scripture to deal with error. That's the purpose. Have a purpose behind it, okay? Verse 5, after he gets done listing of the, the worldly um, problems, he says, but you, be sober in all things. Self-restraint, self-control. Listen, the whole world is looking at you. That's how you need to look at it. They should see Christ. They should be encouraged by your testimony. How you portray yourself to the world is important. Okay? You have to be an image of Christ, of self-restraint and self-control. And all that Christ did, as we look, as we look through the Gospels, he was self-controlled, right? Other than you can probably maybe get whenever he goes into the temple and flips over tables. So that may be the only one. But even, he's probably even controlled in that because, I mean, I guess he could have just called down destruction on it or something if he wanted to. Um, but he, you have to practice self-control. There are many things in this world that are going to try to pull you away from that. Well, it's okay if you do this. It's not okay, you know. It's okay, everyone else is doing it, right? No, you don't want to do that. I am an image bearer of my God. And that means something to me. Endure hardships. If you're a Christian in this world, it is going to get hard. And it's only going to get worse. Only going to get worse. There's going to be times where you're going to be pushed and the world is going to seem like it's always against you, and you're right, it is. Because who is the prince and power of the air? Satan himself. He is going to try whatever it is to make you fail. That's his one goal. His only goal is to make sure you fail. And lastly, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Bring the good news to people. Understand the gospel. Study it. That's what's in sound doctrine. The gospel itself. And take that to the lost world around us. You can look through all sorts of scripture. We're supposed to be the light. Uh, we're supposed to be the salt. All these things for the world around us. It's not just for us. It's for the world around us. Um, so what does biblical doctrine look like in scripture I want you to turn to 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17 right, we're almost right there right right above it it says all scripture is inspired by God right and profitable for teaching for reproof and for correction for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work that is the definition of what biblical doctrine looks like. It's inspired by God. It comes from the perfect one, right? It's profitable to teach us. It's profitable for proof and for correction and for training us up in righteousness. That's the goal. And what, why all these things? So that the man of God, you, the woman of God, you uh, may be adequate. It says, is, he didn't say that you're going to be perfect. No, you're adequate. Equipped for every good work. God has prepared a work for you. And he's given you the reality in which how to perform that work. Right there in Scripture. We should be pursuing a life devoted to Scripture if we call ourselves believers. It is only through Scripture that we can get a correct understanding of what God expects and how to correct the misuse of doctrine. If we are following along with 2 Timothy 4, 2-5, saying we must 
uh, is saying we must know that Scripture says about sin issues. We must know what it says about sin issues, how to confront people we love and friends, well, with great patience and instruction, right? You're going to face trials in your life where you may have to endure hardship. You will have opportunities to help shine the light of the gospel to a lost person doing the work of an evangelist. There will be, there will be a time for rebuke and for proof and for exhortation. This is all to say that we must be prepared for these things. Uh, and a, the way to prepare is by studying scripture. Okay? Having, having sound doctrine. As 2 Timothy 3 points out, all scripture is inspired by God. If scripture comes from God, then it must hold the answers to deal with these things that he's called us to, to help train us, to equip us for every good work, the work that God has placed before us, right? So get in the word and start preparing for the work of God, for the work God has prepared for you. It is the greatest task that we have been given. Okay? Okay. Biblical doctrine. There you go. Now, move on. That was a lot, I know. I'm sorry. Fellowship. Great thing. Our church is named after it. Fellowship Church Lubbock, right? It's because it's an incredible, godly given act, right? But where did it originate from? As Christians, we get to partake in something that is quite extraordinary. Under the salvation that comes only through Christ, we can, we can come together and have fellowship with one another that no lost soul could possibly understand. A group of people who come from all different backgrounds with different life situations and different callings from God himself. Yet to be in harmony with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to look at the first gathering after Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Okay? Acts 2 gives us the first glimpse of what fellowship should look like. After a very strong and convicting word from Peter on Christ and what the prophets of old said about him and how basically they put him on the cross, and the, but this was also to do to fulfill prophecy, um, the Bible says in verse 37 there in um, Acts chapter 2. Got to get back there if you're going to turn there. Verse 37 reads now when they heard this this sermon by Peter they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles brethren what shall we do verse 38 Peter said to them repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you, will be, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Here we get this call of repentance, right? But verse 41 gives us an account of how many were saved that day, 3,000 souls. But I want to focus on verse 42. And the people's response to this repentance and faith after Peter's sermon. The people responded, with two different acts to the saving faith. So what was the first? Well, let's, let's go there, verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, right? The new spirit-filled life that they were experiencing now was evident with a strong desire to know what the word of God said, to know what these teachings were that the apostles were bringing, and they devoted themselves to it. They made it their life's work. They devoted themselves. What are they teaching? And we need to know it because something has changed in them, right? This lines up, obviously, with our first uh, lesson, right? We discussed about this idea of biblical doctrine. They were devoting themselves to it. It was evident in their life. Um, it was a very foundation that would shape and define what fellowship was supposed to look like. Fellowship should always have scripture it should be done so with devoted to the lord it's an incredible opportunity guys that we have as a church to fellowship with one another um and that's where we move to right in the text so they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship now that fellowship consisted of two things 
according to verse 42, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay? So breaking of bread, what is that? Enjoying a meal, right? If you think about it, you can go through the Gospels, and Jesus Christ broke bread quite often and used it to feed thousands of people multiple times, right? Um, with his disciples before the night that he was betrayed, right? That's where we get First Corinthians, right? Uh, where we do the Lord's table, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, and in the house of Emmaus, whenever Cleopas and the other disciple were on the road to Emmaus and they encountered Christ, that very night he broke bread with them. And the cool thing to read about that is when after he broke bread and prayed for it, he gave them to him, and they ate it, and they instantly recognized that it was Christ, and boom, he was gone. What's well, super cool, you know? How, and it's, it, it was, but it's, this was just a Jewish custom that, that, was, that was always taking place, uh, and it was uh, between close brothers. Um, it was a meal symbolizing, in, verse, in Acts 2.42, uh, their devotion and unity in Christ. And it most likely included the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, uh, which we'll cover in a minute, right? So they were breaking the bread, right? They were enjoying a meal together, and there was also prayer. I think it's so important, guys, that if we're going to be fellowshipping with each other, prayer should be a part of it, right? We should be praying for one another. Um, we should be getting into each other's lives and figuring out, how can I pray for you? How can I pray, how, how can I pray um, for you? I want to know. That should be a part of fellowship. So, what we see from Acts 2, 42 should be the example in which we have fellowship with one another. We should be devoting ourselves to the word of God and scripture, right? Doctrine. We should be breaking bread together and enjoying the unity and bond which we share through the salvation that comes through Christ, which is fellowship. We must understand that it is not of our own doing, guys. We must understand it's not of our own doing. But just like in Acts 2, the Spirit is the helper that came and opened the eyes and softened the hearts of these first believers here in Acts 2. The church should be doing life together. That's what it looks like today, right? We should be active in the desire to surround ourselves with members of our local body. Um, and even the people from other churches. That's what we're doing here, right? Um, we should be devoting ourselves to prayer. Uh, this is clearly an example for us to follow and should be evident in the life of the local church. Um, now, I will give more on the importance of prayer. Uh, at the end, it's the very last uh, topic I get to discuss tonight or this afternoon. Uh, but fellowship should be happening with these things in mind. If you are meeting together with, your, with the local body, if you're meeting there with people, breaking of bread, I'm not saying whenever you're together, you need to be having the Lord's table. Um, but if you do, that's awesome. Um, but there is um, some things that you probably want to do it here, not in a house, because there's some things that need to be dealt with before you share in that, that we will dive into in a little bit. Um, but enjoying the meal together and praying for one another is what that's supposed to look like. Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, devoting yourselves to the scriptures. Now, I talked about this Lord's table, so now we're going to jump over into ordinances. Two ordinances that, the church, that Christ has given the church. Um, but what is an ordinance? It's kind of a weird word, isn't it? Well, Webster defines it as an authoritative decree or direction. But we can define it as a command from Christ for the apostles to follow and teach to the churches they were about to plant all over their known world. Okay? But what are these ordinances? That's a bigger question. What are they? So we can go back. Obviously, Matthew 28, right? Whenever he, gets, he goes in commissions, what is he saying? Go therefore make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, 
Now, before we dive into this section, I used an incredible resource. It's a big old white book over here. I was going to bring it up, but I forgot because it's kind of heavy. Um, it's called Biblical Doctrine. Let me get a drink. Um, that we are going through every Tuesday here at Fellowship Church as a men's group. If you don't, never had it, it is an incredible resource for you. It is very uh, comprehensive on all things. And so if you don't have one, get a copy. It's pretty good. But from that resource, <clears throat> uh, hold on, guys, I lost my place. Um, we define it. We, de- we define it as a command from Christ. Uh, I'm it again. In our first section, we saw that Christ commissioned disciples to teach all He commanded, but we also saw that He was baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Baptism is the first ordinance. I want to speak about Um, baptism has been taken to all sorts of extremes throughout church history, right? Um, There are people who believe it's necessary for salvation, um, that that see it as an expression or a decision that was made, yet we want to see uh, what the Bible has to say about it. So Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As Christ Christ was getting ready to ascend to the right hand of the Father, we see him give out his pecking orders for his disciples. So in these orders is the command to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, The word baptize, from this this book, Biblical Doctrine, uh, when used literally, refers to an action like the dipping of fabric in dye, uh, or the immersion of a person in water. That's what the word baptism means. I think these pictures are important to help us understand that meaning of the word baptize. Now, maybe some of you have heard of John the Baptist, right? Wasn't that what he was known for, baptizing people out in the, out in the rivers, right? And we know, but his message can be clearly found in Matthew chapter 3. Verse 11, turn there. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. It says, As for me, John, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am no, I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, we obviously saw that in Acts chapter 2, the, that there. So, what John was doing was for repentance, but what Christ was going to bring was far greater than just water, right? This baptism of water. Here we see the difference in these baptisms. Christ was going to baptize him with the Holy Spirit, um, so if John, being the forerunner of Christ, prepared the way, which was in a fulfillment of Isaiah 43, his baptism was symbolic of what Christ's baptism would be, right? We know from John 14, 6, though, uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes through the Father except for through me. So salvation comes only through Jesus Christ, and if only through Jesus Christ, then we can conclude that the Holy Spirit baptism that Jesus was going to bring was the salvation for the believer, not this symbolic baptism that Christ is talking about in Matthew 28, okay? Baptism is important because this shows the church the conversion that has taken place in you from death to life with the blessing of the Holy Spirit after repentance. And just like Calum talked about this morning, it's not of your own doing. It has been predestined before time by God to do these things. The immersion of the believer is to, be, is to symbolize that washing of the old man, the new man coming forth, right? The old life behind and the new life and the Holy Spirit ahead. So John MacArthur and Richard Mayhew in that book note, it says, in Christ, baptism not only signifies a turning away from sin, but also 
serves as a public affirmation of one's identification and union with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? What an incredible blessing we get to enjoy with the church. But this is not the only ordinance that we are commanded to do, right? These are all so good. Um, let us turn over to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. And it reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We see from this text, the Lord's Supper, when he was with the disciples, he wanted them to remember this last supper as a symbol of his coming sacrifice, right? To remember what he was about to do on the cross. The bread is a symbol of the body that was going to be nailed to the cross. Uh, and the blood that was going, and the, and, and the wine, the cup, uh, the blood was going to be shed as a new covenant in his blood. The command from this passage is in the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. That's where we get the command to do this, this, um, this ordinance here. Do this in remembrance of me. So the purpose of the Lord's table is to remind us of the price that was paid by Christ on the cross. It is intended to bring our thought life back from the busyness of life, okay? Whenever we get to share in the Lord's table as a body, as you do at your um, churches, is a time of remembrance of what God has done for you by sending his son to die on the cross. Not only that, but as a believer, what your service is to him what you have been called to do, okay? And place it back into correct thinking of our service to Christ and his church. So baptism and the Lord's Supper are crucial to the health of the church, okay? Baptism is important because it shows the church the picture of the transforming work that God has done in our lives through the sacrifice of God the Son. And the Lord's table is important because it isn't an act of remembrance for the believer. That's important. It's for the believer. It can't be for anybody else because why would you take the sacraments if you're the ordinances if you don't believe who Jesus is? Um, and not forgetting that our salvation did not come to us free but with a high price. Those are the ordinances. And lastly, prayer. It is important and it should require its own section because the Lord has a lot to say about prayer. There are, there are parts of books devoted to just prayer. We think the Psalms are. There can be songs and prayers of, um, of the people of Israel so this last core practice we'll discuss this afternoon may be the most important. Um, it's the discipline of prayer. And I call it a discipline because that's exactly what it takes to be a prayerful servant. It takes discipline. It takes time for you to say, okay, I'm going to stop everything that's going on in my life, all the important things I think I need to be doing, get on my knees and pray to God. Okay? Not only that, but to say, okay, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing right now and think about uh, Timothy Poff and Nathaniel Moya and my wife. Hope she's having a good day. I hope, hope Micro Bless is having a good day at work. You know, I hope Mike Rush is selling Fords one day. Um, <laughs> but uh, but in, in any way, it takes, it takes discipline to say, I'm going to stop everything I'm doing and pray for somebody else. 
Pray to God. It is a discipline. Many people in churches do not emphasize the importance of prayer, okay? Prayer is crucial to the life of the church because it's the means in which we communicate with God, right? Charles Spurgeon, speaking on prayer, said this, if there be anything I know, anything that I'm quite assured of beyond all question, it is that praying breath is never spent in vain. It's never spent in vain, right? Going to God in prayer can be done in many ways for many things, but it's never in vain. It is always going to produce something. Um, you're always devoting yourself to the prayers, right? So the act of praying is an act of submission to God who has provided us with all that we enjoy today. It is saying, I have put my trust in you and I need your help because I don't do, I can't do this on my own. I've tried. Usually that's why we go to the Lord in prayer because we've tried to do it. We try to make it, make it work in our own circumstances and we try to do all these things and it just doesn't. And then we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't do this. But I'm gonna give this, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be done pursuing the way I wanna do things. I'm just gonna sit back and do what you call me to do and I'm gonna see what happens. And chances are, over time, in his own way, he will accomplish that task. And then you're like, man, I was such a dummy for thinking I can do it on my own, right? We saw in Acts 2, 42, that prayer was involved in fellowship. But it's also something that needs to be taking place in your everyday life, okay? So let's turn to James 5, James chapter 5, 15 through 18. The reason I chose um, this text is a very good picture of prayer, of what it looks like, what it can do. Um, and I think it helps us get a grasp of the power of prayer. Verse 15. Well, let's, actually, let's start on 13. That gives a better context. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayers offered, verse 15, and the prayers offered in faith will restore, will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. So the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured out rain, and the earth produced its fruit. What prayer can do in faith? I want you to look at this, verse 15. It can restore the one who is sick. Okay? It can restore the one who's been going through things. God listens to his people. And guess what? God will answer prayers. Whenever someone is sick, I'm not saying God will always do it, but God can right? God can do it. That's why we lift them up to him. In faith, it can raise up the sick. Not only that, because it, it could offer forgiveness of sin for somebody. When you pray for somebody, when you pray for the Lord to convict someone of sin, whenever you pray for your loved one that's been lost their whole life, and you've tried and you've given them moment after moment of scripture, and you're just, saying, just pouring into them, and it seems like it doesn't work. 
through prayer, the Lord can answer that, right? Not only that, but what else does it do? It can bring about sanctification, right? Um, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed, okay? It can bring about sanctification in your life. You are submitting to God saying, this is what's going on in my life. I need, I need, I need help from this. And it's going to bring about being made into the image of Christ. As we grow in our knowledge and understanding of the word of God, the more our sin is shown, the more wicked we are. We should, we should be, we should see ourselves as wicked people in need of God's grace, right? His love. What about the power of this prayer? That's where we get from the example, right? Elijah. Who is Elijah? Anybody know? Who's a prophet? In the time of King Ahab, right? Ahab was a wicked king who basically uh, chased him out. And he um, basically, Jezebel lied about who he was and what he did. And he ran out to the wilderness and the Lord provided him by ravens and all these cool things that happened around Elijah. But what does he do? James says, here's the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. That should be the goal. To be righteous men. Right? To pursue righteousness. So he gives the, he gives the example of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was a sinner just like us. He was not special. Obviously, he was a prophet. But other than that, back in the Old Testament, God blessed him with the Holy Spirit. And whenever he was done with him, he took the Holy Spirit from him, right? So he was like us. And probably less like us. Because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. He says, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And guess what? It didn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. I know in Texas, we know what a drought is, but we've never seen a drought like that. What an incredible thing to look at, the power of prayer. It wasn't because Elijah wanted to do evil to, the, to King Ahab in the country. No, it was because he said, listen, God told him to do these things. And he listened, he obeyed him, right? And he prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And so then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. We can learn from, and our courage from this text, that prayer is important because through prayer, many things can be accomplished. The sick can be healed. People can come to salvation, and we can grow in our likeness of, to Christ. All this can come through prayer, but it has to be done in faith. We must believe that God can answer your prayers so James gave us the example of Elijah so that we can see that prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, right? That was the whole point of the, of the, the example there. Um, but what do we see? We also see the response from God to Elijah's prayer. Elijah prayed and God answered it. Not only did he answer it, he answered it for three and a half years, right? And when Elijah prayed again, it rained. Just like that. Prayer is important because God does great things through prayer in the life of the believer, in the life of his church. We must be a people who praise, okay? I want to leave you with six different kind of prayers to pray because I wish I could have known about these and had them when I was your age. So from that great biblical doctrine book that I'm talking about over there, uh, may, may Hugh and MacArthur give these, these six different kinds of prayers. Number one, a prayer of dependence. Right? That is a submission, a prayer of submission to God. Number two, a prayer of adoration. 
a prayer of worshiping who God is. Worshiping him, he is worthy of our worship, right? A prayer of confession. Confessing our sin to God. It's it's important that we do that. If we're not doing that, then we're probably not really growing. We're just going through the motions of this life, through this walk. A prayer of intercession. And that's praying for others. Praying that our brothers and sisters in Christ would be healed. Uh, Praying that Dylan Dewitt would be okay after he fell off a roof and broke in vertebrae and had concussion and eight broken ribs. That's what a prayer of intercession is. You pray for him. God, heal his body in a way only you can. A prayer of thanksgiving. Being thankful for what God has given you. Being thankful of what God has given you, the family he's given you. You may not like the family you give me. I don't. They're terrible, but that's not, I don't get to choose that. But I know what I can do. I can be a beacon of hope to them, right? And be thankful for it because he's going to work something out. He's started to work it. He's going to bring it to completion, right? That's what his word says. And last, a prayer of supplication. Provision from God. Asking God for something. I'm not saying asking for a new Ferrari or a new Harley Davidson or no, 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 none of that. No. It's being realistic provision, saying, God, um, I need your help. And whenever I am raising my six year old son, and sometimes he makes me angry, I need to learn to have some self control. I need your strength because it can get hard because he pushes me all the time. He pushes the buttons. I love him to death. God, provide, give me strength. Give me patience, right? And the really cool thing about this is all these things can be found in one section of text. And this is the, not the last text, sorry. Uh, second to last text that I'll give you. A perfect example of this can be found in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Right? What does it say? Christ says to his disciples, pray then like this. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Adoration, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Provision. Another way, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All those six kinds of prayers are included in that one prayer. Of course, it comes from Christ, and of course, it fits. He includes everything in it, that one prayer. These will help you as you leave this place as points to grow in your prayer life. Prayer should be the purpose Uh, Prayer should be with purpose, and these six kinds of prayers will help you. I'm sorry, I already read that. I'll leave you with the final reason for the importance of these core practices. If a church is doing all these things and more, um, it should produce a unity within the body of Christ. I want to end with Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Mr. Paul talked about that last night a little bit to emphasize this unity. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And it says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father. 
of all who is over all and through all and in all. Guys, we should be one with one another. That's the point. That's the whole pur- purpose of practicing this doctrine. It's the whole point of understanding these things so it creates unity within the body. So you are strengthened, you are encouraged, right? As Mr. Calum said, right? To be encouraged, to building up one another. That is the purpose of us practicing these, these, these four things, this biblical doctrine, this, this fellowship, uh, these ordinances that Christ has given us through his word and this prayer that should be evident in the life of his thriving body. Because that should be the goal. It should be thriving. So as you go today, guys, as we get ready to go into our breakout session, think about these things. Think about biblical teaching. Thinking about how you can do things, how you can be biblical in your fellowship with one another. How important these ordinances are and what they mean to us. Um, and how you can grow in your prayer life. Because we we're not perfect, right? The Bible just said that we're adequate. We're not perfect. We're not great. We're adequate. And that's good enough for him. He can use adequate, and that's okay because that's, that's his grace, right? We could be lost, stumbling in the darkness of this world, but yet we are here. Use that. Remember that. Be encouraged by that. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you so much, Father, for these things, and I pray, God, that you uh, be with us, Father, as we go about in our small group sessions uh, after this uh, last, this song. And I pray, Father, that you um, bless them. Be with these small groups, Father. Uh, Father, if there's someone here, God, that doesn't understand these things, God, I pray, God, that you bless them. God, I pray you open their eyes, Father. If there's someone who is lost, God, I pray, Father, that you use this time, Father, to deal uh, with their sin issue and deal with what Christ has done. The gospel can be preached to them. God, go, I pray, God, that you convict them of sin. And Father, thank you for uh, just your word. Thank you for your scripture, Father, which every foundation is the very foundation in which this church is built upon on Christ and him crucified. And Father, I thank you for these things. God, I pray that you um, be with us the rest of this evening, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.